Hey, Bankless Nation, it is time for another State of the Nation. Super excited about today's episode. This is Super Scaling with Starkware. We have two the two Starkware co-founders on. We have Ellie and Yuri of Starkware. We're going to get to that conversation in just a minute. But David, this is the time to bring on Starkware. I mean, this is uh, ZK, ZK Rollups, Rollups in general. Are, uh, are starting to really take off, I think, in a big way. Starkware is rolling out some crucial tech. Why is now the time to have Starkware on to tell us about the scalability strategy for Ethereum and blockchains in general? Yeah, I recently tweeted out that layer two is here. It's just not evenly distributed yet. And some components <laughs> about Ethereum are super scalable. DOIDX is doing more volume than Coinbase. Uh, Immutable it just released its uh, gaming-powered, uh, gaming-focused NFT platform. And it's already like throwing out the, the uh, transaction throughputs. The scalability that we all want to see on Ethereum is being built in these different corners. Yet that is the first version of Starkware's product, StarkX. StarkNet is also coming soon. All of these conversations are, are happening all at once. And definitely in the moment of where like crypto Twitter just absolutely blew up over Ethereum scalability, it's a fantastic time to bring on Starkware to talk about how scalable ZK rollups can actually be when put on top of a decentralized permissionless settlement layer that is Ethereum. Yeah, I feel like it, it, the, the knowledge isn't evenly distributed either, right? It's like we're doing our part, but a lot of this technology is, uh, is, is hard to understand. And so part of what Bankless is trying to do is break this down into mental models. We put together the, uh, the modular, our modular blockchain podcast. You wrote an article about that, David. Would refer listeners to that if you want to get a high-level overview. But we're now on a journey towards like unpacking these ZK scalability type solutions. And Starkware is definitely one of the leading ones, one of the ones we are most excited about in the space. So it's going to be a fascinating conversation. Stay tuned to, for that. Also, some quick announcements. We dropped a podcast with Visa. Visa is going all in on crypto, in the crypto space. Other fintechs are following. That was an episode we just dropped on Monday. David, any uh, sneak peek on that app? Uh, not only Visa, but also Anchorage, which is really the emblem of the DeFi mullet. You got Visa in the front, you got Anchorage in the back. What is it like <laughs> to completely redefine what it means to have fintech, fintech based on crypto rails, not central banking rails? So all, that was, all of that and more in the podcast that came out yesterday on Bankless. There you go. DeFi mullet thesis, right? So the mental models just keep flowing out of bankless, guys. This is uh, this is uh, crucial stuff for you. Also, we need to give a shout out to Opolis. They're doing some cool stuff these days. They're sponsoring this message. Uh, I tell you, David, I haven't, I've heard, I've heard this so often, like somebody telling me I'd quit my corporate job, my boring corporate job in a heartbeat, but I can't because I'd lose my health care. This is, of course, in the U.S. I know other countries don't have these problems, but this is how they keep you a wage slave. This is how they keep you a member of uh, the corporations, right? You, you might want to go where your heart is, go towards a DAO, go where the opportunity is, but you lose benefits. Opolis is an organization that services DAOs that help solve this. They do payroll and they do benefits for DAOs and for self-sovereign workers. We think the future is moving from the gig economy to the ownership economy towards self-sovereign workers and Opolis provides uh, provides benefits for those. Um, anything else you wanna say about Opolis, David? Yeah, this is really the infrastructure that we need to go fully sovereign. Uh, and not only when you sign up for Opolis can you start to have healthcare with your other DAO workers, right? These are all the same healthcare. Opolis is like a co-op. You guys all get to like choose your healthcare together. And we all get to be insured together. And also rates go down as, as the organization grows up, go, uh, uh, gets larger. But if you sign up for Opolis, you get a thousand work tokens and a thousand bank tokens if you sign up by the end of this year. Uh, and so the work tokens is the tokens of the Opolis network. Again, it's just just like every other DAO. If you use it, you become an owner in it. Uh, and so Opolis, uh, making sure that all of the infrastructure needed to be workers in the DAO decentralized world are there so that we can actually sustain this ecosystem going forward. Guys, there's a link in the show notes if you want to get plugged into that, bankless.cc slash Opolis. David, I want to start with the question I ask you in every state of the nation. What is the state of the nation today, sir? Uh, I've done this one before, but I'm doing it again. Today, we are building, and the Starkware team has been super hard at work building out ZK tech for everyone on Ethereum to use uh, as we go through a weekend of drama and FUD. Uh, the only answer to really any of that shenanigans is to just keep on building. Uh, and that is exactly what we are doing here on the State of the Nation. We are building today. 
I want to find out from the Starkware team if they are abandoning Ethereum. My, my guess is their answer is no, but we will get into that in just a minute. Before we do, we want to thank the sponsors that made this episode possible. Arbitrum is an Ethereum scaling solution that's going to completely change how we use DeFi. And now it's live with over a hundred projects deployed. Gas fees on the Ethereum L1 sucks. Too many people want to use Ethereum and it doesn't have enough capacity for all of us. And that's why teams like Arbitrum have been hard at work developing layer two solutions that makes transactions on Ethereum cheap and instant. Arbitrum increases Ethereum's throughput by orders of magnitude at a fraction of the cost of what we are used to paying. When interacting with Arbitrum, you can get the performance of a centralized exchange while tapping into Ethereum's level of security and decentralization. That's why people are calling this Ethereum's broadband moment, where we get to add performance onto decentralization and security. If you're a developer and you want to save on gas costs and overall make a better experience for your users, go to developer.offchainlabs.com to get started building on Arbitrum. If you're a user, keep an eye out for your favorite DeFi apps building on Arbitrum. Many DeFi applications that are on the Ethereum Layer 1 are migrating over to Layer 2s like Arbitrum, and some are even skipping over Layer 1s and deploying directly on Layer 2s. There are so many apps coming online to Arbitrum, so go to bridge.arbitrum.io and start bridging over your Ether or any of the tokens listed and start having a DeFi experience that you've always wanted. Living a bankless life requires taking control over your own private keys, not your keys, not your crypto. That's why so many in the bankless nation already have their Ledger hardware wallet, which makes proper private key management a breeze. But the Ledger ecosystem is much more than just a secure hardware wallet. Ledger is the combination of the Ledger hardware wallet and the Ledger Live app. And if you're used to seeing all of your crypto services and favorite DeFi apps all in one spot, Ledger Live is where you want to be. Not only does Ledger let you buy your crypto assets straight from the app, but it also hooks into all of the DeFi apps and services that you're used to. Using Ledger Live, you can stake your ETH in Lido, swap on DEXs like Paraswap, or display your NFTs with Rainbow. You can also use Wallet Connect inside of Ledger Live to connect to all the other DeFi apps that keep coming online. DeFi never stops growing, and the Ledger Live app grows alongside with it. So click the link in the show notes to see all of the DeFi apps that Ledger Live has, and stay tuned as more apps come online. And if you don't have a Ledger hardware wallet, what are you even waiting for? Go to ledger.com, grab a ledger, download Ledger Live, and get all of your DeFi apps all in one space. Guys, we are back with the Starkware team. Pleased to introduce you to Ellie from Starkware, co-founder of Starkware. Also, Yuri, co-founder of Starkware. Gentlemen, great to have you on Bankless. How are you doing today? Hi, guys. Thanks for having us. Well, we are super excited to, uh, to dig into everything that Starkware is doing in this space. And we're excited because um, this is really this is really kind of the, the scalability answer, I think, to crypto and to blockchains. And, and you guys are are really delivering it and ramping up the delivery of it. So we're going to talk about StarkX, StarkNet, everything that you're delivering. But first, we want to congratulate you on this massive Series uh, C fundraise. So it's a $50 million fundraise, a $2 billion valuation. Congrats on that. How does it feel to be on Thank the you. other side of this fundraise, well, it's uh, you know it's uh, the, the the Series C was done with uh, Sequoia. They've been our investors and close collaborators since our Series A, going back to 2018. So we've known Mike and the Sequoia team well, and that made for a very simple and uh, sort of easy process. So we're, regardless, we're we're happy to to have this uh, sort of uh, milestone behind us. I want to say that it's better to be on this side than on the you know, side before that. <laughs> of course, of course. You guys, there are so many different things that, that we want to dive into with uh, everything with Starkware. But first, uh, you guys have a lot of things that are named Stark something. Uh, and so at the start of this podcast, we want to go in and, and actually label and define these things because we're going to be referring to them more and more throughout the rest of the, uh, the podcast. So there's Starkware, there's Stark X, there's Stark Net. Can you guys define and delineate between these three things for us? Sure. There's so first of all, Starks, but, uh, we'll leave Star them. Starks were co-invented by uh, two of my co-founders, uh, Michael Bryaptev, who's our uh, chief architect uh, and got his PhD under Ellie uh, before uh, co-founding Starkware with us and with Alessandro Chiesa. So they're co-inventors of Starks. That's the uh, zero knowledge pr uh, protocol that we're using uh, in our software stack. Uh, Stark X was our first product, and this is a permissioned 
uh, standalone customizable uh, scaling engine that runs over Ethereum. And this powers Immutable X and Sorare and DYDX and Diversify and soon will power Seller as well. And StarkNet is our permissionless decentralized ZK rollup. And the alpha has been live on a public testnet since mid-June and is going live on mainnet Ethereum before the end of this month. Okay, so just to, to reiterate that, Stark X are these multiple scaling chains that are app specific, right? So <laughs> DYDX is using an app specific ZK technologies uh, uh, platform, which we call Stark X. And also Diversify is also using this, and SoRare is also using this, uh, and Immutable. Uh, but then Stark Net is a, maybe a little bit more what users might be familiar with when it comes to like, Optimism or Arbitrum One, where there's one canonical chain that is permissionless to build on and everyone can build on that. That is not let yet live, but has been in alpha since, since early June. And maybe we have some announcements coming soon about its uh, release date, maybe. Is, that, is all of that correct? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So as, as, as I mentioned, it's been on a public testnet since mid-June. It's coming to main at Ethereum before the end of this month. I should just uh, just one my minor correction. Mm -hmm. uh, the Stark X instances are not chains. They mm -hmm. are essentially uh, applications, services, scaling services uh, powered by the Stark X cloud service running over Ethereum. Okay, let's unpack that a little bit. They're not a blockchain. So where does it? How does it? Why is it not a blockchain? Where the differences lie, and how does it actually achieve scale? Ellie, do you want to? Uh, yeah, I, okay. Um, so um, I think what defines a, a blockchain, I mean, there are several things. It's not, there's no formal definition, but it's sort of uh, this, um, uh, it's very permissionless. It's very, you know, everyone can come submit transactions and, uh, you know, it's something that basically the public uh, sort of uh, runs and uses. And um StarkX um, is, is, as you said, a line of products that each one of them is sort of a backend that services one particular customer that is the, the, another business that is customer facing. So DYDX, it's an exchange uh, that faces customers and it uses a technology stack that is uh, StarkX. It basically uses the ZK Stark technology in order to compress computation and achieve computational integrity without any trust uh, but for trust in math and trust in, in the blockchain. So it's sort of an interface and a settlement layer um, that's very specific to a customer. Um, that's StarkX. So uh, I think it would be a stretch to call it a blockchain. Uh, it is more an interface and a settlement layer and sort of something that boosts up the um, capacity of some other blockchain. And in all of these cases, it's Ethereum. A compression service, if you will, yeah. All right. That's, okay. A compression service. Right. Oh, so you guys talked about, uh, so the word cloud, who is actually operating the compression service? Is that you guys? Yes. For StarkX, it is. Correct. Okay. For so StarkNet, like, it will eventually be a fully decentralized network where anyone could function as a sequencer and prover on the network. Okay. Well, hopefully so, including you and Ryan. <laughs> so StarkX is, StarkX is this technology that you guys have in your guys' own cloud that, that you guys run and you guys allow people like DYDX or SoRare or Immutable to tap into that service? Yes. Okay. And then StarkNet yes. is that same sort of service but more um, uh, streamlined and just made more available for everyone and rather than have it being on one single cloud, it's is it is uh, StarkNet an actual blockchain? Um, it's closer to it, and uh, there's another distinction. So StarkX is sort of crafted towards a very small number of uh, special purpose use cases that are extremely important. For instance, uh, dealing with uh, a massive amount of uh, payments, you know, very high TPS, like for a payment processor. Another example is a massive amount of trades or perpetual uh, swaps and positions or minting of NFTs. So it caters to uh, uh, things where you have very high demand, but for very specific functionalities. Now, StarkNet, in addition to being permissionless, um, it is also a platform that is Turing complete and universal, very much like Ethereum. 
So it means that instead of us saying, okay, you can either, you know, you can do one of four or five things that our customers really want, like, you know, minting, trading, transferring, blah, blah, blah. Basically it says, okay, anyone can write any kind of logic for any purpose they want. It could be generative art. It could be, you know, compressing many votes. It could be some game design. It could be a, a whole number of things that we don't actually know what they are. We basically, uh, you know, the invented and then designed and offered tooling for writing um, any smart contract, deploying it, submitting transactions to it. So instead of limited functionality for these things that are in, are in high demand, it is this general purpose uh, framework. So it's uh, closer to a blockchain. It's not quite a blockchain because it's a layer two. Right, so I think blockchains are more layer one. So just like optimism and arbitrum, I don't think they're described as blockchains. They are layer twos. We are also a proud layer two. I wanted to add to that a very important feature that Starknet has had for a while uh, and will have on mainnet uh, by the end of this month is composability. And this is something that uh, a lot of DApp developers care deeply for. This allows for, you know, for this money Lego or NFT Lego or, or a smart contract Lego to thrive and, and have this amazingly accelerated and open development framework that, that uh, developers enjoy so much. This, this is super cool. And I'm surprised as we're going through these names that Tony Stark, you know, wasn't involved somehow because this is super advanced tech. Uh, I'm, but I'm sure you get that joke all the time. Yeah. Um can, can we talk a little bit about the uh, Stark X first? Because I want to want to just cover that and scalability now, really, with Starkware is kind of the conversation. Then I w- definitely want to spend the bulk of the conversation talking about StarkNet because that is the next thing that is coming. As you said, you're you're releasing uh, to mainnet at the end of this month, so um, we're close to the end of this month. We are we are uh, breathless with anticipation here. But let's talk about Stark X uh, first because there is this impression in the space, and we just saw it last weekend. Okay, literally last weekend. I don't know if you guys, you know, hang out on Twitter at all, but the Twitter world world was a buzz with this idea that uh, Ethereum is not scaling today, that there is no scalability on Ethereum today. Hence, the need for all of these other alternative layer one solutions. And you know, there was a lot of things I wanted to say, but one of the things I wanted to say was, of course, it's scaling today, right? Look at what Stark X is doing, look at what DYDX is doing, look at what Diversify is doing, look at what So Rare is doing, Immutable X, scaling using this compression layer, this, this layer two on Ethereum today. Now, app specific for now, but later, uh, this can be more generalized in, in something like a Stark net. But can you talk about that a little bit? Because I don't think people understand or appreciate the the numbers here and what's actually being done across, say, these four, the big four Stark X applications today, DYDX, Diversify, SoRare, Immutable. Do you guys have any numbers here or any sort of sure. metrics on um, how uh, on what's happening, how this is scaling so far? Yuri, why don't you start? Sure. Um, you know, DYDX would be, I think, one sort of remarkable case study that we could point to. Uh, the transactions that uh, DYDX used to do on layer one, uh, each transaction composing of two trades, uh, a couple of markets only, uh, those were around 250,000 gas, maybe 280,000 gas per transaction. Um, the transactions they're doing today on Stark X touch many more assets. They, they have... Uh, uh, the ability now you can put up collateral against many more positions. And so it's a far more complicated transaction. We estimate that equivalent transaction on layer one to, it will have consumed about 600,000 gas per transaction. Those transactions today in production on StarkX consume sub 500 gas, not 500,000 gas, sub 500 gas per transaction. Wow. Now we're talking about this, this isn't a demo and this isn't uh, like a, a nice sort of case study that we ran for an hour and then brought down. This is day in, day out. The past 24 hours, we're at 10 billion, I believe, trading volume for a DYDX at the end of, of another one of their fabulous epochs. Uh, cumulative to date, over 230 billion, be as in boy, uh, dollars settled on Ethereum, uh, Stark X in total over 55 million transactions. DYDX is probably around half that in total. 
So uh, a very, very dramatic scaling today already uh, on Ethereum. I, we, we, our estimate at 600,000 gas, that's about 300,000 gas per trade. That's roughly uh, three TPS would have consumed all of Ethereum's layer one capacity. Okay, we're doing on a very regular basis, 15 times that um, on, just on, on uh, StarkX. Yeah. yeah, this is just to show what we're talking about. So this is the TPS, the effective TPS that we're seeing. Uh, I hope you see my screen share. Mm -hmm. This is the effective TPS over the past 24 hours. So you see, it's like on average, I'd say on the DYDX system. So this is like, uh, I'd say on average, a TPS of seven uh, with peaks at, uh, you know, uh, 13 TPS. And um, again, as we just mentioned, the effective TPS, if all of Ethereum would have cons been consumed for just uh, settling these, these trades, uh, Ethereum wouldn't, wouldn't be able to, to settle this many. It can handle a TPS of, I guess, one to three. three. Yeah. So at, I mean, at its peak, basically DYDX is uh, another Ethereum, right? Oh, no, it's, than... it's multiple, it, it multiple Ethereums. Wow, yeah. wow. That's just one. So that's just one of our systems, and it's consuming on a regular basis. You know, over the past twenty-four hours, we haven't looked at the numbers, but it's going to be less than one percent of Ethereum's gas while doing something like five to ten. Sorry, five x or whatever, two to five x the capacity of all of Ethereum and consuming 1% of the gas. Yes. And I want to get to so rare and immutable in a second too. It's like, but, but, but what we just said, I mean, that is scalability, right? This is why I feel like there's such a, a narrative mismatch in, in, in the market and in crypto Twitter these days. And it's, uh, it's a very bizarre world we're in right now. Um, so just to, just to recap, there are multiple th Ethereums, perhaps two to five Ethereums worth of capacity that is being settled on Ethereum by DYDX. Yeah. And what you guys said is less than 1% of Ethereum's capacity. So two to five Ethereums being compressed down to just 1% of Ethereum's on capacity. One of on one of our systems. If you take they, the on one of our systems. But I, I want to emphasize that we're not supporting two to five because that's what we can support we're supporting two to five because that's the demand right right uh, we can yes. support substantially substantially more multiples of that easily today and so when i yeah. said uh that, yeah, that, that would probably be another i don't know how many but like another five to ten ethereums mm -hmm. uh you know we minted i forgot how many million nfts over the past uh, half year probably again that would have consumed over, all I, I think about about 25 million nfts Wait, wait, wait. Over is the this, past is six this are we talking about so rare or immutable now or both of them? Both of them. Both of them. Combined. Cross both of them. Okay, give, give us those stats again so we don't miss them. About about I think maybe 24, 25 million NFTs minted to date. Wow. Give or take a few million here. Right? <laughs> That's a few million. So when the start of this show. <laughs> when I said that at the beginning of the show that scalability is here is just not evenly distributed yet. This is what I'm talking about. DYDX hyper scalability. It's just uh, people are expecting like this thing to be happening like ev everywhere equally across the board, but no, that we are getting hyper scalability at like you know sub one penny transactions uh, in very specific uh, examples and applications. these are the applications, yeah, and these yeah, are and what I think StarkX is bringing. I, I want to stress this: these are production systems, so both Cerber and Immutable are working in uh, Validium mode, where they chose to have an off-chain data solution, StarkX employed as a star, uh, off-chain data solution, uh, because they wanted reasonable gas uh, cost per, per mint. Uh, we are minting batches of 600,000 NFTs at sub 10 gas per mint. Once again, 10 gas, not 10,000 wow. gas. Wow, that's incredible. <laughs> yeah, and I think bankless listeners will be familiar with what a Validium is because we've talked about that. We did an episode on modular blockchains that kind of talked about uh, and touched on all of these differences, but that's basically modular blockchain. If you kind of break it up, consensus data and then execution, right? You're talking about a Validium uses um, not Ethereum for its data layer, it uses Ethereum for its consensus layer, but it uses something else for its data layer. Uh, and a Volition of course is, is when a chain had kind of has the choice, an application exactly. has the choice. Um, exactly. but, but I want to ask about this because this, so this is a question, incredible, extreme scalability, super scalability, as we said, is, is happening right now. Are there any trade-offs here? Refresh us on this with, we're still camping on StarkX right now. 
But yeah. what are the trade-offs here with StarkX from a you know decentralization perspective, Ellie? What would you say? Yeah, there, there are actually many, many trade-offs that are behind the scenes. I'll just mention a few of them. So if you want um, latency to be smaller, meaning uh, so what what would what would entail? So right now we're basically taking a very large number of transactions, and you need a very long time for them to accumulate, and then you're producing one single proof for that. So you need also a lot of computation to get that thing. So what you get is you're increasing latency, which is bad, but you're decreasing and minimizing amortized gas cost per transaction because. The larger the batch, that's basically what the magic of Starks give you. The larger the batch, the lower the amortized cost per transaction will be. Okay, so one very clear trade-off is that as we grow the batch sizes, all things considered, latency grows, but amortized gas cost goes down. Another thing is that um, as you, um, yeah, I think that's, probably the most important trade-off. There are other internal trade-offs in our system. For instance, if we wanted to keep, if you kept the same batch size and latency and everything, but you actually wanted the uh, on-chain proof to be smaller, you would pay with off-chain computation because there are various mathematical parameters you can play with there. Um, and that's another trade-off that we have at our disposal, you know, buy a bigger machine, have even more latency, and even for a fixed batch size, you can decrease that. So those I, I, there, there's an obvious trade-off in the context of data availability. If you want to operate in roll-up mode, your data is on-chain. It is no doubt more secure. It is no doubt more expensive. Uh, the beauty of the Volition solution, which is coming online in, in a matter of uh, weeks, um, is that this will uh, this this decision will be handed off from the app to the user, and so the user can decide on a transaction by transaction basis if they care enough for security to pay that premium of on chain data. Will it literally just be like a, a drop down menu where it says, "Here's my transaction. I want it stored on chain, or I want it stored off chain." It'll be just that simple. And here are the yeah. costs, right? And it'll have two different yeah. costs associated with that. Yeah. That's pretty, that's pretty fantastic. That's pretty neat. Indeed. Oh. Ellie, can we go over that latency trade-off again? So it's like, I, I kind of understand that, but like, what is the trade-off that an individual user is making with latency, right? It's like, if I have, if there's higher latency, how does that affect the, I guess, security position for an individual user? Does that just mean things get settled to Ethereum less frequently? So there's a longer window of time where they're potentially vulnerable? That's a terrific question. So uh, currently on Stark X, um, this is very much abstracted away. And the risk of this window is uh, taken by our customers, you know, DYDX, Diversify, Mutable, and so on. Now, what does it mean? It means that uh, you as a user, and, and I'm assuming that many of your listeners have used uh, some of these systems, DYDX. Sure. So they probably notice that they have instant finality. And even if they want to basically go you know retrieve all their funds on chain they get it very very quickly now this does not mean that the relevant stark proofs happen with the same finality but what is happening is something like this dydx which gets these orders and settles them and, and matches them uh, and calculates the positions knows that once it settles something or did something it basically now goes into this uh, uh stack or queue where which is controlled by DYDX, and uh, you know it will take some time for a batch to reach enough size for it to be convenient to put a in a proof, and then for the proof to be generated and and um, and accepted on chain. And currently, for DYDX, for instance, with its very large proofs, this this is a number of hours, but the user doesn't uh, experience any of that. What's happening is that DYDX is essentially assuming whatever risks are associated with that. And I think they made a wise choice. The risks are relatively small because um, they know that um, you know that uh, uh, something that has been settled will appear in a proof, and that a proof will be accepted on chain. And basically, they know what the next state of the. So it's a little bit like I think in traditional trading, a lot of you know settlement is T plus three, 
but uh, a lot of exchanges will, will sort of assume the risk for three days. With a case of uh, DYDX and other customers, it's a small number of hours. And again, it's in their control. For instance, DYDX could decide that it wants to close a batch every, whatever, two minutes. And then the proof would probably be much quicker to generate and would go on chain much quicker. So maybe the um, latency from DYDX's side would not be hours, but minutes. But then the cost would be that the amortized gas cost per transaction would be higher because the amortization is over a smaller number. So most of our customers have chosen to basically crank the knob to maximal batch size, minimal amortized gas cost, but also maximal latency, which is a wise choice, we think. But when, you, when a bunch of more users come and deploy more transactions at a higher rate, you guys can actually uh, increase the rate at which these settle to Ethereum without also increasing the, the per user gas costs. Is that correct? For, for sure. And we can do that thanks to uh, uh, a remarkable technology called SHARP, which, is, which stands for Shared Prover. And this is a, a technology that's in production today, serving at the moment, so rare and immutable and diversify. And hopefully uh, DYDX uh, will be added soon. Uh, uh, to this system. And Sharp basically relies on the fact that all of these uh, systems run on Cairo, our uh, zero-knowledge proof uh, programming language. And a Cairo program can describe any logic, any application logic that one wants to implement. It can also implement a sequence of application logic. Uh, and that sequence can be Immutable's logic, followed by Sawyer's logic, followed by Diversify's, and so on and so forth. So you can bundle all these transactions and all this, these completely disparate uh, applications into a single proof, okay? And now this proof can be verified once on Ethereum, meaning all these applications can amortize their gas verification cost across sort of the Cairo ecosystem. Now imagine if Ryan is launching a new game, okay? And it has just a few users. He's just started out, not terribly uh, sort of, big yet. Uh, from day one, he's benefiting from the marginal cost of the entire Cairo ecosystem, the entire Sharp ecosystem. And so that that is a huge cost saver for low bandwidth applications. That's fascinating because that creates such a virtuous cycle because now here I am with my 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 small game here and like I'm incented to bring David's game in too because I want exactly. him to share in the costs uh, exactly. of the whole thing. And it also breeds some network effects too, I would assume, where everyone wants to kind of camp out in the in the same location to spread these costs. Um, we, we would assume for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Can I just zoom out for a minute? Because uh, I feel like part of, part of the narrative around Ethereum not scaling, these other things is like, um, let, let's talk a little bit about your approach to scalability, because it, I think this is fundamental for people to understand. It's, it's, it's very math heavy. Okay. We, we call this a, a, you know, a compression technology. And we did an episode with, um, Justin Drake uh, called, um, moon math cryptography. And basically the, the whole thesis of the, the episode was, Hey, these blockchains are, are trust machines and the way to scale them up to get up, you know, uh, a giant leap from one generation of the computer to the next is is actually it's not just creating bigger blocks and you know bigger block sizes it's actually cryptography right that's the technology that scales these trust machines right and so to me it seems like you know stark and zero knowledge this is a big ad advance in terms of cryptography technology and the key to all of these unlocks that you're talking about so not asking you to get into the, you know, the moon math or the specifics that would be probably definitely beyond David and I, and, and beyond many in the audience. But can you just talk about this philosophy? Because this is a different path to scalability than I think we're seeing with a lot of alternative chains, which are increasing blockchain size, uh, like uh, creating more uh, complexity and, and difficulty in run, running validators. You guys are scale, scaling with math and cryptography. Can you talk about that for a minute? Uh, Ellie, what would you say about that? Yeah, so um, um, I completely agree with Justin that blockchains are about being a trust machine. And I would add to that that uh, the, the reason we trust them currently is that um, everyone and anyone can be uh, participate in validating that all transactions are good. And they can do so using very 
um, simple off the shelf computational means. So just just here's here's a bad way to scale. What if we just uh, 10x uh, whatever the uh, uh, gas you know the gas limit of a block on Ethereum or increase the block size on Bitcoin? So what would happen is that there are machines that could process 10x more, but it's probably not going to be my laptop, the one that I'm using to talk to you. And very quickly, you'll just have a very small system of very big computers that process at very high TPS. Some so-called blockchains are already doing that. And you know whether they are decentralized and trustworthy is, is open to debate. Certainly, the conventional normie world has been doing this for a very long time. I'm sure that banks and you know, credit card companies have very big data centers. But blockchains don't want to do that. They want to continue and maintain inclusive accountability that allows each and every one of us to use our laptop to check that everything's okay. So what are we going to do? Well, there's this amazing math that started in the 1980s, um, and we're not going to describe how it works. But to quote from one of the very earliest papers in this field, um, I'm probably misquoting the exact thing. I can find it later. But it says that using that, this technology, again, that was invented already in the 1980s, even a single weak uh, computer can monitor and track a computation done by a herd of super computing, computers, even if they are run on faulty hardware by malicious parties. So it's a wow. very... Cryptography is this amazing, powerful technology that allows even the weakest of computational devices to monitor and know with very high certainty that a huge computer run by an evil government even um, has been executing with integrity. And this is completely mind boggling. So, you know, the, the little man can basically check and know that some huge corporation monopoly or government is operating correctly because of the power of cryptography. Now, this was already known, some parts of it were known in the 1980s. What was not known was how to make this like really efficient and tractable. And that's, I think, where a lot of the inventions coming from, from Starkware really help. And first of all, making it practical on today's computers. And more recently, making it available to programmers. I just read today someone that wrote, uh, you know, here's my experience of working on StarkNet. And the very first sentence is, you do not need to know anything about the math of, of Starks. It's all been abstracted away. You just have a programming language and you write your code and you automatically, you know, you press a button. And so you just program as a developer, no math, no nothing. And you get this uh, very low gas cost. Uh, and the integrity offered by some magic that is behind the scenes. It's incredible. And it got, by the way, I just got to say, it's like cryptography is just what a gift to humanity, right? <laughs> of all of the technologies that we can unlock at this um, juncture in humanity, we get this freedom technology that we've just unlocked. What a gift to humanity. It is. So one part before we get into the conversation of uh, Starknet, which we definitely want to go to next, next um, it's, it's really fantastic that you guys have abstracted away all of this complex technology and just allowed people to build on with this coding language and, and APIs. The other side of that spectrum is like, well, if you guys are just making it super easy, you guys are centralizing all of the development onto your guys' cloud server. So there's this one cloud server that's doing all of this central processing for these many, many systems. So what happens in the case where the police force of the United of the of the world come and knock on your door and says, "Well, unplug the server." What happen, What happens in that case? Well, if it's so if of it, course, if sorry. it happens before we decentralize, which would be in a small number of months, then yes, uh, you know maybe we'll uh, just uh, release everything before we uh, <laughs> go out with the police to some undisclosed location. But the the plan and the hope and our and, you know we we certainly believe this will be the case is that within a very small number of months, it won't be uh, Starkware operating these things. Uh, the code will be available and many, many operators, including uh, you and Ryan will be uh, uh, running it just like with Ethereum. So kind of in that way where we talked about having the drop down menu of where you deploy your data, might you have a drop down menu is like, oh, I want Starkware to run my server, but or I, I want to run my server. Like you guys probably will do both. 
Well, like Ethereum, like, uh, mm-hmm. you know, you don't get to choose your miner. You, there's some mm-hmm. consensus thing ah. that pick the next. So something like that. You'll send it to some network, peer-to-peer network, and there'll be some uh, some mechanisms by which a decentralized network of provers and sequencers will pick it up and it will be accepted. You don't choose which one, but that's, I think that's probably even better. You're not, you're not burdened with that. You just send your transactions in the network Ethereum style. Wait, so is this now what you guys are talking about right now? Is is that StarkNet or is that something? To, okay, exactly. so, okay, so we've actually gotten into Stark the StarkNet. Net. Okay, can you guys talk about the evolution from StarkX into StarkNet? How is that transition going to happen? Yeah, and I'm actually, as you're speaking, I'm actually going to bring up this um, this diagram that I've seen in a lot of your documents that kind of illustrates it. And uh, yeah, so for, for people who can't see this on the podcast, there's uh, three steps and uh, over the top, there's 2021 and 2022, and this is kind of the 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 Starkware roadmap as I see it, and uh, the Starknet roadmap to be more specific. The first step is planets. That's a single operators, single app rollups. The second step is constellations, single operators, multi app rollups. This these these two steps are both in 2021, and then yep. the third step in 2022 is the universe, which is decentralized operators moving from single operators to decentralized and multi-app rollups as well. So with that, with that context too, uh, yeah, to David's question. So, you know, planets is essentially Stark X, right? These are single operators. So rare, immutable X, diversify, DYDX. They're each running a single app rollup. Okay. And that's been in production. Three of these systems went live in, in, uh, in April, the numbers we quoted earlier you know, exceeding uh, 50 million transactions, settled, et cetera. This is across all these uh, systems. Constellations is essentially what's coming in a few days time. And that is a single operator in the, in the context of uh, uh, the StarkNet system initially, much like the op- optimistic role of playbook, optimism, arbitrum, we're following in the footsteps of our uh, very talented colleagues in the roll-up space, uh, starting with uh, a single node operated by us. Uh, it will be a multi-app roll-up. This is this goes back to the composability point uh, that I made earlier. So um, folks would be able to deploy their smart contracts on this, invoke one another's smart contracts, and uh, you would have a single roll-up with all these applications running on top of it. And Universe, which is coming next year, is the fully decentralized vision where the operator, namely the sequencer and prover functions, are fully decentralized. And all this bliss is shared across multiple applications, sharing estates, invoking one another, et cetera. So on the uh, step two, the constellations, is this where Immutable and DYDX will actually find themselves on the same rollup? So th- that, that is a separate question of, of if and when the StarkX instances currently running choose to port and uh, move over and run over StarkNet. Okay, uh, but for Stark, uh, for constellations, we're talking about, for example, uh, teams like uh, Zigzag, which is uh, building a decentralized exchange uh, that announced that they're going to be launching in a matter of days on StarkNet and Influence.East, a wonderfully talented uh, uh, team building a game. Uh, these will all deploy on StarkNet and coexist there and be able to invoke one another. So, so guys, go ahead, hey, go ahead, David. Okay, you go. Uh, so the conversation that we've been having in the space, the space has been having, and I, I know a number of people by, that are confused by this point. The ZK rollup bulls think that ZK rollup EVM is powered ZK rollups are going to be here in six months. The optimistic rollup bulls think that the development and like infrastructure needed to make ZK EVM rollups isn't going to be here for three to five years. What's going on? Like, what's true? So unfortunate, unfortunately, Vitalik uh, published a post in early 2021 this year uh, announcing that ZK rollups are the long-term solution um, that they're coming in three to five uh, years. Uh, as, as we apologized already a few weeks ago, uh, on, you know, we're sort of ahead of schedule. So, so this tooling is here now. In fact, it's been on a public testnet since uh, the middle of June supports general computation, supports composability. There's still a ton of work to be, uh, to be done. And it's being done as we speak. If folks hop on the StarkNet Discord, they'll see a very thriving ecosystem of tooling and infrastructure that's being built in a decentralized fashion 
by dozens of developers outside of Starkware. Of course, Starkware itself is contributing a significant uh, uh, amount of talent and resources into this. But uh, all this tooling is being built on a week by week basis and making tremendous progress in that respect. So we are able today to support essentially any application that wishes to build on top of StarkNet. And in fact, what we're already seeing is people doing stuff that is just completely out of bounds on layer one. Uh, so to give a couple of examples, uh, Guilty Gyoza, just a, a brilliant programmer who's doing all these sort of physics simulations on StarkNet. Now, some, some people said, you know, what is that good for? I think that's a, it's sort of almost a silly question in the sense that the question is not what is it good for? The question is why aren't sort of people registering the fact that any computation, any computation that one chooses to do is now suddenly within the reach of blockchain developers. Whereas when we were limited to layer, layer one, uh, it was a very sort of resource constrained environment. So, so Yuri, I just want to just highlight the answer to that question is like, you're saying it's here now. You're saying general purpose ZK rollups are here now ahead of schedule. And that last yes. phrase, ahead of schedule, it's like, like yes. that, uh, that, I, that's not I, something we hear very often in crypto. I, I, yeah, okay. Folks making those statements <laughs> do not consult with us. Now that's fine. <laughs> but like, uh, I mean, if, you know, uh, making, it's well known that making predictions about the future is very hard. And if you're trying to predict something about a field of ex expertise, it would be prudent to go and ask some of the experts what they think. So, you know, you have two of the experts. Uh, it's not a prediction. You know, we have uh, how many, four systems running, many of them for more than a year. Uh, we just saw the numbers. Um, now with general computation, on Ethereum, scaling it, as you mentioned, you know, two or three Ethereums, each one of them today, not three to five years, not six months. This is something that happened in the past. Now, next week sometime, um, StarkNet Alpha, it's already in testnet, but general computation, same sort of scale, um, available to everyone. Next time you want to make predictions about ZK rollups, you know, you can know, you know where to find us, DM us, uh, check with us before making the prediction. And um, yeah. We'll, this, we'll... this is great. Look, this is incredible. You won't find a single person listening who will be disappointed that you just said that, okay? We've just been, um, we feel like with crypto in, in terms of scalability, we've been disappointed too many times, right? Which is like when, when, when teams talk about dates and the shipping, it always seems to slip, slip no, by. So now you guys are shipping. Probably. Yeah, so you guys are shipping, you have it. So can we talk about uh, what then is shipping next week, right? It, like what exactly? So understand it's a, a general purpose version of um, a StarkNet. Um, are there any applications that are launching? Is it going to be uh, permissionless at launch? So can any team decide to start building on top of this? Or is there going to be a phased rollout, some sort of whitelist? Uh, yeah, give, give us some more details on uh, what should be sure. next week. We, sure. We, we'll link a post uh, with a, that has a lot of disclaimers on like what is not in there. So there's a lot of things that we're very um, uh, meticulous in pointing out. You know, we don't want to make false statements. So but we'll share. There's a lot that will be missing initially next week. Account abstraction won't be there. There should won't be RC20 tokens. There won't be any, uh, uh, it will be very hard to deal with fees. A lot of things will be missing, but there will be applications. And uh, in, in terms of um, deploying, um, anyone can submit a contract initially for computational purposes. So that, you know, the system might be buggy and not running as well as we want. We will do a whitelisting process, just like Arbitrum and Optimism and other um, L2s to ensure that uh, you know our system is not crashing, and this will be removed later on. Um, I'll find the link. I I, I just want, I want to just mention some of the uh, of the folks who are building, and and some of these will launch with the alpha. Some in the uh, uh, weeks following the StarNet alpha launch. I want to reiterate what Ellie said. This is called alpha for a reason. 
uh, and we we strongly urge everyone to sort of proceed with caution. That, you know, when our training wheels are on, uh, we're all sort of figuring this out together. Uh, so uh, you know, we 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 want sort of people to fully appreciate that fact. Uh, but some of the sort of the ecosystem that's uh, being built around Starknet. So we have the Nethermind team who are building the Warp Transpiler and the Voyager Block Explorer, the Open Zeppelin who are defining the standard contracts uh, for Starknet. Last time they defined that, that was for this blockchain called Ethereum. The Aragon and Equilibrium teams who are building full nodes, Figment who are building API services, Argent who are building uh, tooling in a wallet, the Taurus wallet, Ledger who are building an application to go live soon. Uh, the Shard Labs team building tooling, the Yuki, Yuki uh, front end team, multiple. A whole bunch of applications, a whole bunch of applications. So just to name a few, Snapshot announced uh, uh, recently that StarkVote, uh, we're building StarkVote together. Uh, so this is to make voting for DAOs uh, once again, sort of open to the general public and not an exercise for the wealthy whales. Uh, there are multiple games being built. First and foremost, there's sort of the wonderful Parama, who was really one of the very first folks to start building on StarkNet, building Dope Wars and another surprise uh, sort of a game that will be announced very soon. The Proof of Humanity team, Guilty Gyoza, who we mentioned, the Influence team who are built, moving their... Uh, wonderfully uh, uh, interesting game from layer one Ethereum, Bricks, our clan, the Starknet.js uh, framework by Sean Hanks Exchange, we mentioned the QSAR team, Maker has a, a core unit, uh, moving sort of Maker to, or deploying Maker on, on Starknet, and hopefully one day soon minting die on Starknet. And rumor has it, uh, just following crypto Twitter, some, that some core devs of Aave are looking into uh, building an Aave version on Starknet. So as you can see, there is an awful lot going on. So I can't sort of give you exact dates of each one of these things, but we're talking weeks here uh, yeah, this for all is, these things to start rolling out. This is fantastic. And I, I'm wondering if you could kind of project forward six months <laughs> for us, right? It's like getting getting to a user's head, right? So all of those apps sound wonderful if they're deployed on, on um, you know, Starknet, that would be fantastic. Also, other things that are important is wallet support, right? It's like, you know, the MetaMask of the world, you mentioned Argent, which is fantastic. Um, layer two, oh, sorry, uh, fiat on ramps as well are going to be super important. So if you For project sure. this forward, you know, six months to maybe even like nine months to 12 months, do you think all of those things will be in place? Like this will feel like basically a fast Ethereum type of experience, or do you think it's going to realistically take a little bit longer? I'm I'm an optimist. I think uh, in, in six and definitely twelve months, all of that and much more. The main thing that look back and and be surprised at is like, all, you know, some new classes of applications that cannot live on L ones because of the gas crunch there, and suddenly there's some new class of stuff that that uh, you know we can't predict right now. It's going to be there. Um, the main thing that will happen within um, the next six months and certainly nine months and 12 months is a lot of standardization and a lot of uh, ecosystem growth. There'll be a whole bunch of uh, standards for various things, you know, account abstraction, fee abstraction, um, interactions, bridges, ERC-20s, ERC-721s, and so on. And people will be using them. But much more importantly, will be either past the decentralization point at universe where there will be multiple provers running permissionlessly um, and uh, we'll probably also have uh, decentralized validium uh, for data availability and volition. Uh, initially we'll start in roll-up mode and we'll probably already be en route to various decentralized governance mechanisms and all they entail. So all of that will be, uh, uh, basically our, our goal is, you know, Starkware currently is you know, a company that is running all the start provers for these production systems. And within six to nine to 12 months, you'll see that dramatically changing 
um, and, and we will not be running the majority of the provers and sequencers and data availability providers. Well, Ellie, that gets right into the part of the conversation I want to go next, which is that long-term horizon for what Starkware is with it, as it relates to the rest of the ecosystem. And ZK Tech is actually a platform uh, agnostic tech. And so we actually can talk about this tech outside of Ethereum. Those are the conversations I want to get to next. But first, we have to talk about some of these fantastic sponsors that make the show possible. Matcha, everyone's favorite DEX aggregator, has just launched an open beta for gasless trading. So if you're trading more than $5,000 in common ETH and wrapped Bitcoin pairs, then your gas fees on Matcha are free. And that's why you should be using Matcha. Matcha routes your orders across all the various DeFi exchanges on Ethereum, Polygon, Binance Smart Chain, and gives you the best possible price without any trading fees or unnecessary slippage. Matcha has smart order routing that splits your orders across multiple liquidity sources if Matcha sees that, that it gets you better pricing. Trading on Matcha is super easy because it pulls the liquidity for me into a single and easy to use platform and has even saved me multiple times from accidentally picking the wrong decks to trade on and getting a bad price. Matcha also allows you to make limit orders on chain so you can set and forget your DeFi trades and they will go through automatically while you're away. So when you're making a trade, head over to matcha.xyz slash bankless, connect your wallet and start getting some of the best prices and most liquidity when you trade your crypto assets. Alchemix is one of the coolest new DeFi apps on the scene. It introduces self-paying loans, allowing you to spend and save at the same time. Deposit the DAI stablecoin into the Alchemix vault in order to get an advance on the interest it generates. Borrow up to 50% of the total amount of your deposited DAI in the form of AL USD stablecoin. Here's the craziest part. The loan pays itself back and you cannot be liquidated. Unlock your assets potential in the ultimate DeFi savings account. And brand new to Alchemix is the ETH vault where you can deposit ETH into the application, borrow AL ETH against your deposits while having your advance gradually paid back over time. V2 is rapidly approaching, which will allow for even more collateral types, plus a variety of yield strategies to choose from. Harness the power of Alchemix at alchemix.fi. That's A-L-C-H-E-M-I-X dot F-I. Follow Alchemix on Twitter at alchemixfi and join the Discord to keep up to date with Alchemix V2 and to get involved in governance. All right, guys, we are back with the Starkware team coming into the second half of the show, just tying off some loose ends with, with some of the things that are uh, not yet talked about on the show. And the first one I want to talk, talk about is the long-term prospects for Starkware, the company, uh, because you guys are trying to decentralize your own products, which kind of means you're trying to decentralize yourselves. So what's the long-term future for you guys? What's the long-term future for Starkware? I want to take a swing of that. First, you know, I, I would mention that we've, we've decentralized successfully with our kids uh, so far. So. <laughs> so I wanted to say that the number one objective is to keep on having as much fun and uh, meaningful fun and uh, keep on uh, expanding this amazingly talented and uh, capable team that will grow into an ecosystem. That's uh, objective number one. Um, but as, as uh, David correctly pointed before the break, uh, ZK Stark technology is much bigger than just a solution for, um, you know, scaling Ethereum. Um, initially, of course, it can and will be adopted by, uh, we think, pretty much all blockchains that require scale. It's sort of just like all over the world, you know, you'll see fiber optics everywhere because they, you know, scale bandwidth really well. And you'll see, you uh, you know, cell technology, right? Cellular phone technology everywhere because it like scales, you know, communication or makes it easier. You will see ZK Starks on all blockchains that still exist. And, and we Starkware would like to help that happen once we can put our focus, right? You can only do one thing at a time. Uh, but beyond that, we think that this technology that allows even, let's go back to the cryptography that allows even simple citizens to uh, sort of hold and check the strongest of monopolies and uh, governments, this is something that we all need um, today. So we think it will permeate from that into the larger world. Now, that's about the technology. So there'll be a whole bunch, there is already a whole bunch of other teams that are driving this forward with Starks. And we're very proud 
to see them and help them. You know, there's the Winterfell and, and Maiden effort that is, is now incorporated into Polygon, and we very much support them in this effort. There are some other teams that we know are dabbling with Starks, but have not gone you know, public with that information, and we support them as well. Um, so this will be, there will be multiple ones. Now, for Starkware, we hope, like, you know, what are we going to do after this decentralization? So, like, two very possible routes after, like, let's say, decentralizing. One is it's very plausible that some of those uh, conventional um, institutions and corporations and so on might want something that is uh, their standalone version of, of Stark technology, and we can help with that. And the second thing is uh, hardware. Uh, as more and more provers and more scale is demanded, uh, we might uh, want to try and help with that. So there's at least two opportunities. Oh, Ellie, I want to ask you a question here about decentralization. So, so some other... I guess uh, la layer two's answer to this partially, uh, and even layer one's is about you know community ownership as well, right? Some sort of like tokenization, some sort of form of community ownership, you know whether that takes the form of a governance token or something like that. How important is is community ownership to your uh, roadmap to decentralization? What would you say about that? Very important, but uh, on the specific question of token, uh, we, we hold to our position of no comment. Gotcha, that makes sense. Um, can you talk a little bit about, like you mentioned this with Ethereum, right? So, and you also mentioned that the this technology is um, agnostic as well. Um, but it seems like as, as David and I have uh, talked about this, it's, it seems like those chains that have embraced this more modular uh, design this modular thesis rather than a, you know maybe the contrast is a monolithic where you're doing execution and consensus and data availability all on the same platform. Uh, the more modular chains will be probably first to pick up this technology. And Ethereum is definitely with a roll-up centric roadmap, definitely adopted that. Near is maybe another one. Tezos is maybe a, a, a third. Um, do you think that the the more modular chains will be first to adopt this sort of uh, technology and I guess, do you have any thoughts or comments on where this might leave the rest of the blockchain space, like the more monolithic designs? Do you think they eventually capitulate and sort of become roll-up centric and more modular design oriented? Any longer term thoughts here? I, it's, it's, this is something that's hard for me to predict um, for two reasons. One is that we, our focus is just very limited on this one thing and StarkNet. So it's very hard to, uh, I mean, we did get approached a bunch of times by various L1s, you know, asking if we want to deploy and, and we gave the same, we need to focus answer. And then I would still, if I, if I had to give an answer, I would say, just like I said, with like uh, fiber optics or cellular technology, Starks are going to be, anything that still lives in, uh, you know, five years in its blockchain will, will want to use just like, you know, any, communication network in a modern country today probably has some fiber optics. So I would say any blockchain that is massively used would also want to use uh, ZK Starks because they, they just offer you this asymmetry, right? Having one huge computer do a whole lot of work and everyone else trusting the outcome, even if that node doesn't have to be trusted. That's a very powerful technology that, that, that I think all blockchains are going to want. One subject we haven't touched upon uh, yet is is privacy. Are there any privacy ties in terms of what you guys are doing? Well, I mean, we we are Starkware, and all of it is like Stark, and we're sort of omitting the zk, which is part of you know the whole line of stuff that we invented. Right. So, <laughs> knowledge, um, and we even did a little bit. There's some open source stuff that is already uh, you know there's a signature post quantum secure signature. That we developed that's also open source and um, um so yes for sure at some point we will add privacy and zk to that's another thing about focusing right we we there's probably demand for that we just can't uh you know uh defocus right now so so but yeah there's tr tremendous opportunity and demand there the scale with the privacy is uh you're right we sort of neglected it recently just for focusing purposes. Hey, David, you're muted. 
Thank you. One thing I want to ask about is uh, the economic sustainability of Starkware, the business. Like, what's the actual business model there? How do you guys make money? Sure. So at the moment, StarkX, uh, these are commercial agreements that we have with our customers that generate revenue. In StarkNet, uh, we hope to be one of the participants in this open network and provide services to the network and uh, hopefully generate revenue by doing so. As Ellie mentioned, there are other venues to consider beyond that. For example, hardware, we're building applications for the many normies we expect will show up and want to benefit from this uh, beautiful decentralized trustless world. Um, so, you know, those are all directions that uh, we're actively exploring and, uh, and working on. Right, so with the, the commercial agreements with the Stark X chains, um, like Mutable, DYDX, uh, you, you're, if you're making money off these things, it must be coming off of the transaction fees of the network, right? Uh, I don't understand how it would be any, anything else. How, how, how are these agreements made with things like teams like DYDX and Immutable? And it, it, how does the, can you just illustrate the, the value flow from the people that transact on these things to how it actually becomes economically sustainable for Starkware? Sure. So as you know, as just going to say, going back to the, the DYDX numbers, if, if uh, a DYDX transaction on layer one, if such a layer one existed that could support their, uh, their existing throughput, if that's at 600,000 gas, Mm. And, and on our system, they end up spending less than 500 gas. Well, there's a huge pie here. Uh, uh, and, 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 you know, everyone could be made uh, exceedingly happy. The customer, DYDX, Starkware. So, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of value to be had. Is it just as simple as, uh, say, I'm an, uh, an immutable user, I'm on immutable or DYDX, and then... Uh, I uh, make a transaction. The system charges me a dollar to transact on that uh, on that layer two, and then that's split up between you, you and DYDX, or you and Immutable. Uh, uh, I'll give an example. DeFi pooling is this beautiful service that Seller is going live with, uh, powered by Starkex. And DeFi pooling caters to the long tail of DeFi uh, participants who are priced out of the market on Ethereum layer one today, okay? They wanna transact on Aave, on Compound, whatever it is. Layer one transactions are absurdly expensive, okay? We're talking about people who wanna put a few hundred or a few thousand dollars to work and end up spending tens, maybe hundreds of dollars in transaction fees per transaction. DeFi pooling basically allows them to move uh, their assets to layer two, pull them together like carpooling services, and those carpool services then initiate transactions, single layer one transactions that go from that layer two system onto layer one. So they pool together a hundred users or a thousand users that all go combined in a trustless fashion, say to an, uh, initiate an Aave transaction. So a single layer one transaction now is split across. So they can pay this service. Uh, they spend far less on gas. Ethereum is far less burdened with all these transactions. Aave is getting all this action that would have been sort of just, you know, left out of, of the market. Um, seller is making money. Hopefully, Starkware is making money. Everyone is better off for it. The market is more efficient, right? right the so pie like is bigger. The pie is actually bigger, you yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, the cool thing about all these rollups, it adds just economic activity to the, the greater pie, right? Gr growing the pie. So the, the idea for Starkware is that, you know, if, if we can 2x the pie, uh, it, it, you take like a 5% of the, the extra growth or something like that. That's the business model? Yeah, well, 2kx the pie, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> is there an actual like percentage that you guys charge or, or how do you guys actually structure your fees? So, so the, 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 the fees are sort of a commercial agreements that what we put in place with our customers mm -hmm. and um, that handle sort of the, the uh, sort of the, the revenue side of things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there each, uh, each individual yeah. agreement with each individual chain is its own agreement or do, are they kind of just like similar agreements, similar structures? No, no, they're actually, they're actually very similar in structure, if not identical, actually. Okay. I want to say something about actually uh, like a potential, uh, you know, business uh, model just around fees on StarkNet for, for and, and now not for Starkware, just for anyone running operators. So um, the, the argument goes like this. Um, 
you know, currently take the OIDX as an example, right? We are consuming much less than 1% of the network, but uh, offering scale that is like roughly, I don't know, 5x or 10x more than that. So there's like a thousand X factor uh, or a thousand X reduction in cost between doing a transaction on L1 and doing it on our L2. So now what if um, the fee charged by uh, such an L2 would be let's say one tenth the fee of an L1. So if you run the numbers, uh, first of all, users would be extremely happy because they're paying just one tenth, um, but this leaves huge profit margins for the uh, network, right? And if you take into account that, for instance, on Ethereum today, the daily fees are around like $60 million and you're taking, uh, you know, you're consuming 1% of the network, but you're charging, let's say, uh, in total 10x that while doing 1,000x more, everyone's happy. And the actual, you know, uh, revenue per day for the operators is something around if I got the numbers right, like $6 million per day, just in fees, and most of it will be profit and the users are happy. Now, I'm not saying this will be the uh, main or only business model, and it's not something you know we, we, we explored in depth, but I'm saying just by the fact that there's this huge amount of fees being spent today on Ethereum, along with the amazing you know, 1,000x scale factor that, that our L2 will bring starting next week, there's a, a very lucrative business model that sits just even there. Fantastic. That's a that's a fantastic color. And guys, I want to thank you for your time and helping us unpack what is this really, really complicated technology in very easily to digestible ways. I want to zoom all the way back out for this last question. And something that really just fascinates me personally is like the the relationships between humans and code. Right. There's a there's a there's a link here. And crypto, as me and Ryan often say, crypto is a political revolution. It's not left or right, but it is anti-authoritarian. Right. Uh, and so when you guys are, are looking at, at Starkware and looking at the code that, that you build, do you see any sort of like values alignment? Like what how does Starkware, what you guys are building at Starkware align with the values that you guys have? I, so I, you know, I can I can share my personal perspective. So I. You know, so looking back over the past few decades, technology is just technology, right? It can do all sorts of, of things, good good things and bad things. And often the same technology can be put to good use and, and, and malicious use. Um, I think that a lot of the things that we're building are inherently uh, for the better in the sense that they are inherently supportive of shifting the power of balance away from centralized entities into the hands of individuals in all sorts of very meaningful ways that Ellie alluded to earlier. And, uh, and that is something we care for deeply. And, and I think it's something that a lot of people all over the world are concerned about you know, over these past few years and they should be concerned about. And having the technology that can support those values and do so at scale meaning not as a thought experiment, not as a little sort of exercise in independence, but something that can actually serve their daily needs yet uh, protect those rights and, and, uh, and privileges is something we care for deeply. I wanna add two, two different thoughts. One, I think um, the values that uh, we have at Stark where I think the first things that jump to mind that I think distinguishes us are like, uh, meritocracy and uh, excellence. Um, you know, we have like audit teams looking at our code and saying, you know, we haven't seen many code bases that are, you mentioned code, like that are as professional and clean, even though this is like very, very uh, moon math stuff and very easy to get wrong. So I think we have, um, I mean, our whole team, right? It's, it's, uh, um, both Uli and I don't really code, but uh, fortunately for all of you guys, yeah. <laughs> I don't think the audits would have looked <laughs> the same way had we uh, dabbled in that. But um, like this, very uh, we're very proud of this, um, you know, excellence, professionalism, and meritocracy when it comes to code, but also you know to math and science and innovation. The second thing I would say is that uh, we do. We are having fun 
but we do recognize that through this, um, you know, opportunity offered by inventing a technology that we believe will transform the world, we understand that there's immense responsibility on our collective shoulders. Uh, we can try to get it right for humanity and we could mess it up. And I think so far, we've really, really tried to focus on making decisions that are correct, not only for our own personal you know, short-term goals. For instance, I'll give one example. We founded the company in 2017. Everyone was ICOing. Everyone said, guys, you know, just do an ICO. At the time we raised 6 million. Uh, people were raising, you know, 10x and 100x on that with technology or with promises that were not as, you know, impressive as ours. So we didn't do that because we said it, it's not right for, uh, for you know, the state of the technology. And we went first for building very specific applications, handcrafted, like StarkX is very limited. It does like a few things. Um, so we're like, treading with a lot of responsibility and recognition that we are lucky to have this power to uh, you know, unleash this technological revolution and we hope we'll uh, make decisions that are good for all of humanity, but uh, you know, who knows? Eli, Yuri, it's been an absolute pleasure. I think that's the perfect way to end it. The tremendous amount of responsibility on our shoulders being early to this movement. We completely agree. It's part of the, the bankless nation. It's part of the bankless journey. We appreciate so much what you guys are doing in the scalability space. And we are massively excited about StarkNet and uh, what you're delivering both next week and in the weeks to come. So thanks for joining us today. Thank, Thank you, guys. It'll be a fun ride. Absolutely. Bankless listeners, um, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you learned a bit more about one of the, the premier layer two technologies coming. I certainly learned it was even, I knew it was close, but it's even closer than I thought at the end of this podcast. So once again, another Bankless podcast, I am bullish. Some action items for you. If you are a builder, if you're interested in developing on StarkNet and this technology, make sure you check out the show notes. Join the, the Starkware Discord service where you'll find a lot of information about this and fellow builders who you can build alongside with. Also, we'll include a link to the post that was mentioned earlier about the StarkNet uh, Alpha release. And I expect to see some posts next week about the mainnet release too. Very excited about that. Risks and disclaimers, of course, none of this has been financial advice. Maybe this is scalability advice though. ETH is risky. DeFi is risky. Crypto is risky. You could definitely lose what you put in, but we are headed west. This is the frontier. It's not for everyone, but we're glad you're with us on the bankless journey. Thanks a lot. Hey, we hope you enjoyed Thank the you. video. If you did, head over to Bankless HQ right now to develop your crypto investing skills and learn how to free yourself from banks and gain your financial independence. We recommend joining our daily newsletter, podcast, and community as a Bankless Premium subscriber to get the most out of your Bankless experience. You'll get access to our market analysis, our alpha leaks, and exclusive content, and even the Bankless token for airdrops, raffles, and unlocks. If you're interested in crypto, the Bankless community is where you want to be. Click the link in the description to become a Bankless Premium subscriber today. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel for in-depth interviews with industry leaders, Ask Me Anythings, and weekly roll-ups where we summarize the week in crypto and other fantastic content. Thanks everyone for watching and being on the journey as we build out the Bankless Nation.